What we're going to talk about in this lecture is observing people to discover their needs, goals, and values. One effective starting point for designing new technology is to clearly identify an existing problem or need. And that's because finding a big problem and need often yield important untapped opportunities for design. Observing people can also help you build empathy and think from their point of view to stand in someone else's shoes or maybe to wear someone else's gloves. Mike Kunyavsky is a colleague of mine and a design consultant and author. When we were talking about the role of fieldwork in design, he gave me the example of an electronics firm that makes devices for truckers. Apparently, the systems were underused, and sometimes when responses were provided, they were pretty minimal. These mobile devices had small physical keyboards. When the designers went into the field and spent time with the truckers that used them, they found that many truckers had big hands and wore bulky gloves, making it near impossible to use the tiny keys. The resulting redesign featured a large touchscreen. This interface provided common responses with one click, as opposed to lots of typing. And the dynamic display made it possible to have big buttons, and a stylus was introduced for precision input when that was necessary. From this example, you can see the wisdom of something attributed to Yogi Berra that you can observe a lot just by watching. What we're going to talk about today is participant observation techniques for standing in someone else's shoes. Of course, observing people isn't the only way to begin designing an effective user interface. Great designs emerge through all sorts of approaches. That said, it's often a good strategy to begin your design process by attuning yourself to your users. The techniques in this lecture are inspired by the fieldwork strategies that anthropologists use to learn about and document culture. In 1914, Bronislaw Malinowski traveled to Papua New Guinea, where he conducted field work at Mailu in the Trobriant Islands. While he's there, World War I breaks out. He has two options, either hang out in the Trobriant Islands or face internment. I think you can guess which option he picked. During this period, he developed the practices of participant observation, which remain a hallmark of ethnographic research to this day. In this photograph, Malinowski is being taught to play a, a string instrument. The picture of Malinowski is a wonderful illustration of what Genevieve Bell calls deep hanging out. By spending time with people doing their work and living their lives, you can get beyond the surface things that people say to learn about what they actually do. If you've ever lived in another country, I bet you've found that there are all sorts of things that are normal to the people that live there and completely unfamiliar to you. But you don't need to go that far or even go anywhere to begin to recognize the beautiful complexity of culture. It's all around us. For example, being a student requires an enormous amount of practical knowledge and constitutes a large number of practices that you enact every day and are rarely conscious of precisely because it's such an everyday behavior. But if someone was suddenly dropped into being a student with no knowledge of what student life was like, they'd have all sorts of trouble. Furthermore, much like the intuitions that we build up when we learn to play a musical instrument, there's all sorts of stuff that we do as part of our everyday behavior that's really tough to articulate. So, what we're going to hopefully learn by participant observation in this class is five key things. First, what do people do now? What's the baseline that we're starting from? Second, what values and goals do people have? Most often we want to build technologies that align with what people care about and what they hope to accomplish. And by that, I don't mean literally building what people ask for, because people often don't know, especially for disruptive technologies. Rather, what I'm talking about is designing technologies that will weave themselves into the fabric of people's everyday lives, even if they introduce new concepts and functionality. Third, we're going to look at how these particular activities are embedded in a larger ecology of behaviors. For example, we might be tasked with designing a better technology for a bus or subway. Of course, for any individual bus or subway user, the bus or subway segment is just one piece of a larger activity, like getting to a friend's house, or commuting to work, or going to the grocery store. And by understanding the constraints and goals of that larger activity, you may come up with ideas that you wouldn't have if you were just thinking about the bus ride more narrowly, like what leads somebody to select or not select the bus. Even if your original design brief was about improving the literal bus, what you might end up with as a designer is something more broad, like creating a mobile application that helps people figure out 
when the bus is coming or nearby or the best way to get from one destination to another. Taking this broader view can help you be more effective as a designer by helping design for the larger activity that people are engaged in. And designing for that activity can often take you away from the narrower brief that you originally began with. Fourth, what are similarities and differences that you can find across people? In our bus example, a low mobility user might care enormously about the accessibility of the bus. Somebody else may be primarily concerned with cost, and somebody else still might be primarily concerned with efficiency in getting there. One of my favorite examples of participant observation comes from Jack Whalen and colleagues at Xerox Park. They were studying a call center for photocopy repair. So these are people who field questions from te technicians and over the telephone help them work through troubleshooting broken photocopiers. Doing this over the phone can be extremely difficult. What Whalen and colleagues found was that, as you might expect, the most proficient person in this copier repair center was the person who'd been there the longest. It was a skill that they'd built up over a period of time. What's interesting is that the second most effective person at this repair center was not the person who'd been there the second longest, but rather the person who sat next to the person who had been there the longest. What they realized was that by sitting next to an expert, these repair technicians were able to pick up all of the informal skills of doing repair work that aren't written down in manuals anywhere. And it's this apprenticeship model that helped somebody really excel in their job. One effective strategy for learning about the work practices of your users is to apprentice yourself. For example, my former PhD student, Ron Ye, did his dissertation on software tools for field biologists. And as part of his dissertation research, Ron, in essence, became a deputy field biologist. He trained as a docent up at the Jasper Ridge Preserve near Stanford. And he accompanied a field biology group with them on their field site trips to places like the Mexican rainforest. So as you can see, another advantage of doing field work in technology design is that you get to go to lots of fun places, too, sometimes. Even say you were interested in making a better supermarket checkout system, you might apprentice as a clerk, and one of the things that you'd learn for that is all of the different workarounds that clerks do as part of their daily activities. Being a good apprentice is an interactive process. To get going, you'll want to set up a partnership with the people that you're working with. And of course, you'll probably get some formal training. That's the process part of the job. Often that formal training includes a bunch of asides if you're getting trained by somebody who currently does that job. And those asides are the extemporizing that happens as part of the job. And definitely, once you actually get involved, you'll realize all of the everyday hacks and workarounds. If you see something that catches your eye, it can be important to validate that with those that you're working with. And so you can reflect things that you see back to people. And that can help you understand why those things are being done. Pay attention to all of the artifacts that compose part of people's work. And in particular, look at ways that people have hacked their equipment to be able to make their work more effective. One of my favorite examples of this is post-it notes. Think about a fax machine or some other piece of equipment that has post-it notes all over it, reminding people how to use stuff. That's a great example of an opportunity for innovation. Or, for example, in my recording setup here, uh, I have a, a note that I've made to myself to turn off the Dropbox file syncing software when we record. Dropbox is a great way to keep all of the machines that we use up to date. Um, but it sometimes seems to interfere with the video recording, so I left myself a note. You could see that as an opportunity for redesign to, for example, turn off file syncing automatically while video recording is underway. In particular, errors can be a real gold mine. And what's interesting is that often I think that when somebody can't figure out how to use technology, it can be easy to assume that it's just because they're stupid or they're, you know, they, don't, they don't know what they're doing. And that attitude is, I think, less pervasive than it used to be, but still quite common, that the development team often looks down the nose of the users. And one of the most effective ways I've ever seen to combat this is in the 1980s, an anthropologist named Lucy Suchman worked with Xerox Park to study photocopier usage. And one of the things that she did is she produced a video of two people trying to produce a double-sided copy of 50 pages of paper. 
and you'll see this video here. There's a bunch of buttons here. So output paper tray, copy mode, one-sided, we want two-sided copies, unload top paper tray. Oh, because 49 must be on the other side. <laughs> this video has become a legend in the human-computer interaction field. We saw just a short clip out of what's a much longer video. And legend has it that when this video was shown, the executives said, well, you know, those, those users just are just dumb. They don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. And at that moment, Lucy Suchman and John Seeley Brown, who collaborated with her on this work, gave the reveal, which is that those two users were Alan Newell and Ron Kaplan, two of Xerox's premier research scientists. They were giants of computer science research, and in this way, you couldn't say it was because they didn't know how to use technology. All of a sudden, it made you realize that if you were unfamiliar with a particular piece of technology, that stuff that could be a lot more difficult. And that led Xerox to help focus more strongly on the user interface. What we've talked about throughout this lecture is the difference between what people say and what people do. And I'd like to close by giving an example from Walmart. A couple of years ago in a survey, Walmart asked its customers whether they would like the aisles to be less cluttered. I bet you can guess what the response is. Yes. I think anybody, if asked that way, would say, I'd love the aisles to be less cluttered. So, very diligently, in response to the survey results that Walmart got, they decluttered their aisles. As this news article reports, Walmart spent hundreds of dollars decluttering its aisles, removing inventory, cleaning things up. And what happened is that they lost a billion dollars in sales. This seems surprising. They did exactly what people asked, right? But Walmart made two mistakes that, after having taken this class, you'll be able to avoid. The first is that they paid attention to what people said, rather than what they did. The second is that their survey asked a leading question, would you like the aisles less cluttered? Put together, this gave them a, a direction that was exactly the opposite of what turned out to be the most effective. I hope these techniques that we've covered today and these examples will help you as you do your need finding in your project assignment. And if you're curious and would like to learn more, here's a few resources that you can use.